Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And, uh, Alex, you've played your fair share of, like, role-playing games, haven't you? Yeah, I, I'd say that's a safe bet. Okay. Um, did you ever find that maybe it was uh, a little hard to get into it at the front? Uh, some games, yes. Some oh. games have a very high entry to th- uh, threshold entry. I see. Well, it would be great if there was a way that you could get introduced to it uh, in in more of a, a natural way. Maybe make it a little bit easier if you were uh, just getting used to role playing games. Yeah, that would be helpful. Thanks. Okay, so <laughs> so with that said, uh, we are very happy uh, that we have Mr. Hal Burdick on the show. Hal, thank you for coming on. Oh, thanks to uh, you, Nathan and Alex and Delvecast for having me on. Can't wait to have this uh, podcast and see where it goes. Absolutely. We're we're still wondering ourselves, and we've been at it for almost three years now. So <laughs> that's fun for everybody. Um, now, Hal, uh, you're a game designer, uh, in case you didn't know. And I thought he was a, a, an astronaut, but thank you. That yeah, I, came, I came back down from my latest shuttle mission to to have this podcast with you and talk about dice and danger. Oh, very nice. Uh, yeah, t- yeah. Speaking of which, dice and danger, very cool idea. Uh, why don't you just give us the rundown of, of what dice and danger is? Well, dice and danger is a uh, it's an introductory uh, tabletop RPG. I, I think of it as Candyland meets basic D&D, where uh, it's a simple race game where, like Candyland, where you're trying to get to the end first. Um, but along the way, you are uh, meeting monsters, battling them, taking their treasure, and uh, escaping the dragon's lair with all the loot. And so it's not a victory point game. It's a race game. It's he who gets out of the uh, lair first. And so it makes it very simple, very understandable for young age kids. And that's what we're targeting. We're wanting to get, um, you know, children in the 6 to 12 range, I think is probably the target range for the game interested in playing games that are like a tabletop RPG. So this is a game that I could get my son into, being that he's seven, and he would hopefully not have a hard time grasping it. It would be something for his age range. It is for his age range. The math he probably the, that he approached, he probably saw that math in kindergarten, which is basically compare one number with another to see which one's larger. And then there's simple addition of the treasure cards that you get, like a magic sword or a pumpkin bomb. You get to add to your attack roll when you're fighting a monster. And then there's a few other cool cards uh, related to other different things that you can do in the game. And and each character also, each player also gets dealt a character class. So... Each time you play the game, you get the experience of different strategy based off what the powers of your character class are. But as you can see, it's also introductory to the kind of basic tenets of uh, Dungeons & Dragons or Pathfinder or, or, or other similar game types of, of fantasy where you are having a character class, you are going through a complex, and you are battling adversaries called monsters and getting their treasure. Ah, nice. very nice. So how many players is Dice and Danger for? I think uh, the best games are, I mean, it's it's pretty good for two to four players. Uh, do you get bored if you get up to six players? Maybe. I don't know. It's <laughs> I've only played with four max. But we, it, it can accommodate ten players, but it would be... A lot of people standing around a table to play the game with ten players. Mm. So it's uh, basically. I feel like that's not a good idea for a game that's meant for younger kids because attention spans run very thin. 
Right, right. So that uh, and that's it. The, the, the game is is has lightning quick setup. It's basically just shuffle a deck of cards and put your pawn on the space that you're supposed to do. Deal out the um, the character class cards, which are gonna which are gonna be this particular game, and then you roll to see who goes first, and you're off and running. Then the gameplay itself, when we've done all the testing that we've done, the games last about. 15 minutes. Nice. Oh, wow. Very nice. Very nice. This is the kind of RPG I could play. Yes. You can start with That's it. That's good. Yeah. And it's very fun for uh, basically what happens in every game I've seen where the parents and the kids play together is that the parents start role playing. Uh, the monsters that they see along the board. And, uh, and when they're, when their children land on the ghost and they'll start making ghost noises and talking in classic D and D tropes and memes, you know, so, so you gotta start yeah, the kids early. it's a fun game. I, in my, in my playing with all my nephews, I had four boy nephews. I, I would always kind of like Candyland. I thought that was the kind of the paragon of the early games. I would try and lose. I, Hi ho, Cheerio! It's just a nightmare, and so is shoots and ladders. I would let let the kids cheat. But when it came to Candyland, I kind of wanted to win. <laughs> <laughs> well, Even there's candy. The strategy. I was just liking to be there first. It was kind of fun. There's oh, yeah. much more strategy in um, uh, in Dice and Danger, and I bet there is uh, an ultimate game theory strategy that could be played. But there's enough luck in the game that uh, the, the, in any one race, a six-year-old has a very legitimate chance of beating their father or mother. Very good. Uh, and I think anyone who played Candyland knows that strategy was not a big strong suit in that game. <laughs> Pretty much draw a card and just go to whatever color. <laughs> it right, says to go. Right. This roll, so you, and you make a decision of when you're going to use your treasure cards. Do you use your treasure cards early? Do you, do you use them late when the monsters get more difficult? So there's a little bit of strategy. I actually, uh, the uh, Rowan James, who worked with us this summer, she was undefeated up until we actually shot the Kickstarter video, and that's the first game she ever lost. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> On uh, in dice and danger, but uh, oh my god! But so there is there is good players. I have yet to win, and I'm you know I've lost in probably twenty times. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, well the, I, I guess that's probably encouraging in some respects. <laughs> yeah. they, if everyone got got a hold of the game really quick, that they could beat you really really <laughs> easy. <laughs> <laughs> there's no there's no designer advantage obviously in this no game. apparently not i know all the ins and outs of the game damn i lost, lost <laughs> i i i made the game i just can't win the game now What's it, <laughs> that work out for me um now what was the what was the impetus to actually create dice and danger in the first place well i i my day job um for 25 years was in education and I worked in reading comprehension, math and writing. And mm. so I've written children's books. I, we used to do a lot of testing so, at the company. So a lot of that writing was in, um, for creating reading items for kids, uh, from kindergarten up through college. And so you learn to write at varied levels and you understand how important the reading level that a student is being introduced to goes with their reading. If you try and give even a very advanced third grade reader, David Copperfield, he's not going to be able to handle it. So you need mm -hmm. to target the, um, the uh, reading based off how difficult it is, as well as developmental appropriateness in terms of the content. And so I've always had that kind of in my mind as well. You learn with basic reading primers for reading and then you move into books like encyclopedia brown and goosebumps and then you graduate up to harry potter and then you're finally getting up to where you're reading um 
by the end of your journey, maybe Supreme Court decisions, which are, uh, are <laughs> as dense as can be. <laughs> those, are, yes. those aren't meant for reading. Those are meant for, like, paperweights. Yes. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I think I would go back to Harry Potter pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was actually going to ask you what the uh, reading level of your game was, since it's for younger kids, and it seems like you actually have a really good grasp on that being that you've done it for so many years. Um, it's so I'm very, assuming it's very difficult to be explanatory at lower than like a second grade reading level. Um, because first grade, you're going to just be learning to read. You're not necessarily. And so the way that you write text for people learning to read versus when you're trying to provide them information is a little bit, different and a little bit more complex and so you know like this is a hammer is a very good um uh sentence for learning to read but this is a hammer doesn't tell you anything about what a hammer is so uh uh so that kind of stuff is going on so we've targeted the reading to be at about the second grade reading level with uh, that meaning that precocious kindergartners uh, could probably read it so, so my son, who's going into second grade, actually wouldn't have a problem with it. Um, I think so. If he's reading already, he wouldn't have a problem reading any of the. I think. I think uh, the other year they were like, "Yeah, he's reading at like a second or third grade level." I'm like, "Okay, cool." <laughs> yeah. So, like I feel great. My son is reading at a good level, so he would be reading this, and he would be able to get the meaning of it, and he would maybe struggle a little bit on some stuff. Um, just if it's new to him, yeah, but yeah, be but it'll be a, it's a simple the the reading and the math is not going to be the problem. It'll be the it'll be the introduction to a new world that he's never maybe never even experienced before. That'll be the uh, thing. Like, oh, what's a minotaur? Okay, a minotaur is a monster with the uh, the head of a bull <laughs> and uh, looks like a man, but uh, has big evil horns. Oh, okay, all right, it's a monster. So that's what so they, they kind of register their mind. But then you get details on what exactly that monster is. So we're going to give kids a whole new brand of dreams. Yeah. Right off the bat. <laughs> this is not for the faint of heart. Some of the board is a little bit scary, I would say, for the kid guards. But when I was growing up, uh, instead of Candyland, we played the original Dark Shadows board game, which I highly recommend. It, it was like Candyland, but you have black spiders and bats and, and, and kind of stuff. You can look that up. That, that's a treasure if you can get a hold of a copy of the original Dark Shadows uh, board game. Very nice. That, I that do. Some influence. And so, uh, so with that educational background um, and knowing I, I was introducing my youngest nephew, uh, the one that we talked about that had the uh, brain tumor, um, to the world of Dungeons and Dragons. And he immediately, he was eight years old, he immediately wanted to be the dungeon master. And <laughs> it is very difficult to be a dungeon master if you can't read the rules. So we, so I went and, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm a, D and D nerd since the time I was thirteen, and I'm what fifty one now. So I've I've been playing the game regularly for forty years, and um, and so I said, you know, I know enough about writing for a lower reading difficulty. I'm going to make a set of rules, and those rules were called Atlas Kings. And where he couldn't read Dungeons and Dragons rules or even the Dungeons and Dragons light or Pathfinder light kind of rules, he could read Atlas Kings. And he then he immediately was able to become the Dungeon Master and he created his first dungeon called the Stolen Ruby, like I said, and the rest was history. And uh, it was I had I, I had gamer fun. I didn't just have um, uh, fun playing with my nephew. It was actually Wow. All right, this is a good adventure. <laughs> I'm having fun. <laughs> My cleric is is more is out there to do the do justice for the king and return his ruby from the evil dragon that stole it. So it was good stuff. Uh, I I'm sure a younger dungeon master like his age would actually come up with dungeon uh, not just dungeons but uh, plots and things that 
your normal experience veteran gamers our age or whatever would probably come up with. I feel like a 12 year old, for instance, would come up with a wildly different idea of something to happen than somebody who's been gaming for 20 years is in, in, in their 30s. Yeah, you're right, because you get kind of like into the groove of what an adventure should be, and you can't do the uh, manatees that look like uh, BLT sandwiches kind of adventures, <laughs> unless you are... I don't know what you're talking about. Are, <laughs> ...new to the game, you know? So uh, mm-hmm. I think the creativity that you're showing with your crazy adventure is something that it would be commonplace with the uh, with the uh, kid with the kid DMs. Yep. It, that, that, it, it, it does sound like it's right up my alley. I, I don't know who would have thought of stupid monsters like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no clue. Um, <laughs> save the BLTs, everybody. Um, so, so uh, wh- when when did you actually originally get the chance to to play the game uh, with with your nephew? This was How- he's twelve now, so it was four years ago, and that was King's. Came out. We run a we ran a brief Kickstarter and uh, produced it and delivered. And um, you know, it was it was you know a few people found it. It wasn't uh, a ton of people that found it. And uh, it was it did exactly what I needed it to do. My nephew is now an avid Dungeons and Dragons player. He has graduated from Atlas Kings to the proper five E rules mm-hmm. and. Uh, and so now he is off on his own in the world of, and so he was really excited about the opportunity to go to Gen Con. It's unfortunate that it didn't work out for us, but he really is a gamer. He's a gamer now. We would have lost him due to the fact that he couldn't read the rules, I think. He would have gone to the world of video games. But instead, due to the fact that I was, that we were able to produce that something that he could actually do. He became the dungeon master. He ran his group for his friends, and his friends are now all D&D players. And I really want to preserve this game. I mean, I've played it for 40 years. I loved it when I first grabbed it on the thing. I saw the Skyrims of the world come out, and I played all them, and those are great. But at some level, they're limiting because you have to pre-code, spend millions of dollars to make those games where... A, my nephew can just take the take a rule book and then all of a sudden come up with a really cool adventure, and that can take you know a couple hours. And uh, and so he is uh, he's now joined that world. He is not against playing a uh, round of a computer game on the Xbox, but he loves to play tabletop as well. And so from that, from this Atlas Kings experience, then I was like, you know, I'm really starting to like board games again. And so I thought, well, how do I utilize this aspect of board games that is, you know, board games are new, the new hit. There's, it's kind of the research, renaissance of uh, board games. I think Kickstarter and the ability for um, uh, game designers to kind of make their own games independent of the big game companies has kind of created that. And so I was like, well, I could use this as a way to uh, even get a younger approach and and, and a simpler approach than somebody having to actually understand what a role-playing game is to get them into role-playing games. Now they're just playing a simple race game, but all the tenants are there. They're, They're battling monsters. They're getting treasure. They're, avoiding traps, uh, there's magic items that they are using. And so it's just a baby step from uh, playing the game on the uh, board that we said to saying, hey, what if we went out off the board and said, hey, now we're going to um, play uh, uh, an adventure that's not just the getting out of the dragon's lair. Now we're going to go into the vampire's crypt and we're going to go fight the vampire and, and stuff like that. So I know that Dungeons and Dragons originally uh, uh, came from miniature playing and, and people were just wanting to uh, kind of take their individual guys and have them go off and do things as mm-hmm. opposed to being on the miniature board. And so it's just kind of naturally intuitive of a step going from something that's kind of an obvious game to then moving to a, role-playing game once you realize that you want to do more than what the the, the, the current game is allowing you to do. 
Right, right. Um, and I feel like, uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons can be really intimidating for people, even if, if they're not kids. Like, even well, even now. <laughs> like, like your first time attempting to play D&D 3.5 with me? Yeah, yeah, that didn't end well for my ranger. Not at all. But, uh... Maybe, maybe if he ever uh, was able to get out of that crypt, it would have gone better. But <laughs> it's just unfortunate. Um, yeah. So, so I mean, I I, I get the idea. Um, now, how many uh, did you have? A lot of play groups that you were able to get uh, to to try this out. Yeah, we've we've played with about you know we we, we game theory is our home base of a store. It's in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, the manager is actually on our, uh, Kickstarter video. Uh, he's always wanted to have a kid's game section. And, uh, um, and he, he was, he's always sold Atlas Kings there. And so we were talking, um, about it and he, he was kind of part of the impetus for me working on that. Cause he would like to have that. So we've gone over and played there. So, good dozen times and uh sometimes we've just shown it to the parents and they've just played with us really quickly and then sometimes there's actually been a, a couple of kids actually in the gaming store that have played with us and then i play it with uh uh kids i know i have a couple of godsons now that that love it and they'll come over to their house and play and and so it's it's it, trust me before anybody brings out Toots and Ladders or Hi-Ho Cheerio, I'm saying let's just go ahead and play Dice and Danger instead. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I can win one of these times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that hasn't happened yet, has it? <laughs> no, no. I've lost 20 games, probably 20 games myself. And we've also had, um, uh, you know, Jim's played with a, a bunch of people. They actually ran a 24-hour Twitch, and they played – Probably when we launched the Kickstarter, they probably played, you know, 24 games of Dice and Danger during the 24 God. That's, uh, that, that's uh, scary. They're <laughs> <laughs> thinking about doing a 48-hour Twitch to oh end up like, oh, my God, guys. All right. See, see if you can set a record. <laughs> how, how long can we play continuously? <laughs> right. No bathroom breaks, nothing. You don't get it. Like a David Blaine, something like that, or uh, yeah. So, what is the uh, what is the youngest player that you've had play the game? The youngest player, four years old. All right. Okay. And at nice. four, and at four, he was he was not an exceptional reader or anything like that. And so, in a, at four, I think the strategy of the game is a little bit overwhelming. Um, and uh, and uh, you're kind of playing the game for him. Like you say, you know, he'll play with his magic cards open face, and he'll and you go, why don't you play your magic blast there? And he goes, okay, I'll play my magic blast. <laughs> so yeah. you're, you're <laughs> That's a good play. idea. <laughs> what a great I, idea. I, so I you're basically that. playing that game for them in terms of the strategy of when to do what when when they're that young. And uh, yeah. uh, it'd be a pretty precocious four-year-old that can actually really do it. Where Candyland, you just say, there is no strategy. It's, oh, you got a double purple. You move one, two. Okay, I just move it there. So the same kind of thing happens. But it's not like they are not enjoying the game at four. Uh, but I we recommend six to 12. Right, 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 right. I mean, at least the, the beauty of it is that I'm guessing if the rules are easy to read, they're also probably easy to teach. Oh, very much so. Yes. Yes. Yeah. There, and we've learned a lot through the um, uh, and what what you know we're we're revising the rules a little bit based off of uh, the uh, some of the reviews that have come back and some of the play tests to get it exactly fine tuned. Like there's a thing about with the queen's blessing card, which will add a plus two to any die roll, and can you use two bless two queen's blessings? in one turn well we haven't written that role that rule yet but the answer we've realized through the uh, play testing that that's probably the best way to go is that you can double stack with a uh, queen's blessing if you want to 
Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, like uh, I know that the rules are, are pretty, you know, uh, uh, simple so that it can be uh, easily absorbed for the younger set. But yeah. general, generally, what, what does a turn look like for me as a player? Okay, as a player, you would uh, – okay, so you, now you're on this track that you're trying to get out. You've started at the dragon's treasure. Now you're trying to get out, and you have to actually battle the dragon. He's going off to take a bath. So you were teleported <laughs> into the dragon's lair when he, when uh, the wizard saw that you that he had gone off to fly off to take a take a bath. You were teleported in, and you were going to be a quick in, get the treasure, and run out. But then, oh, uh oh, there were other monsters along the way, and now you're going to have to battle your way all the way. Um, out and dragon knows when his treasure has been stolen. So he's going to be waiting for you at the final pass and you're going to go through it. So it's basically a roll and move. You roll and then you're going to land on three types of squares. There's going to either be a safe spot. So there's no monster. There's going to be a monster spot where then you have to battle the monster. And there's a big number on the board under each monster. And that shows what number you have to, roll over and we did went with the d10 we wanted to introduce the odd shaped dice uh when mm. we went into it we did not go to the d20 because for a couple of reasons but the number one reason is that the math becomes significantly harder for kids if it's not single digit math and you go into double digit math and so that's just something i know from the education thing is like yeah, that's that. That's a needless. So we went with a D10, not the D, not the typical D20 that you see everywhere. But you still get that odd shaped dice that kids have never been exposed for. They do tend to really like cool looking dice, as everybody. Kind of does. Oh yeah, <laughs> when yeah. You get to use the Dungeons and Dragons is a dice kind of the coolest thing. Oh yeah, the polyhedral die. You get a set of those, and you're like, aren't these sweet? These look so much cooler than the six sided ones we're used to in Monopoly. This is great. Yeah, um, my greatest loss in the world was when I lost my basic edition D and D dice, and I am still sad about that because I, used, oh. I I had those for thirty years, and then all of a sudden during one of my moves they just disappeared. Oh no, that's treasure that's, lost. Oh my god, <laughs> or my basic D and D original dice. It was probably that dragon. Yeah. <laughs> The dragon stole it. Gotta wait till it goes and takes a bath again. I oh, I have to. Yeah. Dragon. I got to say though, um, that is that is usually a plot point that it goes very underused. That the dragon has to go and take a bath, and I feel like that should be used in more campaign. I just want the the moment where the 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 treasure gets steal, stolen. And the the dragon goes, oh no, the tre and he wraps a towel around his waist and comes back. <laughs> <laughs> just says, why? My treasure! And he's, like, dripping wet and he's running after you. He seems a lot less terrifying at that point, but <laughs> that's something to, to work on for art. Uh, <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. You Which, just want uh, a bath dragon. A, a bath <laughs> dragon? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like a water dragon. I think it's like a, it's like, it's like a water dragon. Sea, dragon uh, turtle. sea serpent. Yeah. But but with a towel, oh, it's a towel. It's got to be a towel on his head. Put a towel around his head because he just did his hair or his scales. Yeah, dragons don't tend to have much in the way of hair. They they sometimes have they're their uh, their, their main things. Furry what? dragons. Yeah, there's 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 uh, like feathered dragons. Have you been listening to that show I recorded? <laughs> I, I've started. <laughs> But but I'm I'm kind of scared now that you've given me the foreshadowing. I don't know if I want to continue listening to it. For um, dragons, there. Oh, okay. That that's fair. What were we talking about? <laughs> bath dragons. Oh right, your 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 bath dragons. Yeah. No, I'm scared of those too. Um, since since uh, I'm coming up with some intriguing artwork for you. You you actually have somebody that did professional artwork for you for this game, correct? Yeah, it's Joel Rose, who is a fabulous artist. We've done a lot of collaborations together, and I cannot uh, endorse his artwork better. He's very good with kind of a cartoony style, um, mm -hmm. 
but that cartoony style can get really, really twisted. So he is not necessarily always going to be doing a cartoony kids thing. He, he, I call it, hey, Joel, do one of your things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you on, on stuff, it's like they're like these montage, well, montage, a murally kind of swirling, swooping bunch of faces, bunch of. Interesting shapes, creatures, smoke, you know, all this kind of stuff, art. And I, I wish I had some examples just to show you right now to see what I was uh, talking about. But uh, but uh, he's, he's a pretty fabulous artist. And uh, for this, he simplified everything, made it very kid-friendly. He's done that with uh, some uh, Blue Popcorn magazine, which is a, a, a thing we did together, which was a, a reading magazine for kids. He's also done the cover of, oh, yeah, if you Google Lights Out Rowan or um, Rowan to the Rescue, the covers of those are kind of exactly what I'm talking about with the, with the cool art swirl. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Um, so when, when you say, like, like scary monsters, they're not necessarily – they're more like a cartoony kind of version of a scary monster? Yeah, but it, it walks the line between being scary and cartoony as opposed to being like Casper the Ghost and uh, stuff like yeah. that. We didn't want you to fight in Casper. <laughs> we like Casper. So, Casper's, fr- Casper's a friendly ghost. <laughs> Casper is a friendly ghost. I would feel like morally outraged myself more than, than a physical threat. It's kind of an ethical challenge if you're fighting Casper. But uh, but his brothers, I'd yeah. fight them. They were yeah, mean. Those guys would be, uh, uh, things. you know, it's, it's, uh, you battle a witch, you battle fire giant, you battle owl bears, stuff like that. And, and, uh, and, uh, there's art for it, you know, and he, he, it's kind of, it's kind of a unique thing. Have you seen the board? I have not. Mm, yeah, I have. Yes. You have? Yes. I didn't oh. link the picture to you. No, that's why I haven't seen it. <laughs> well, we actually have on the www.dysondanger.com. You can uh, go there and see copies of the board, copies of the um, cards, uh, copies of the rules. We're basically, you know, it's up there. If somebody wanted to kind of home make their own game, God bless. We'll do it. We think it's cheaper probably to just and better just to come with buying our game. But if you want an arts and crafts day, knock yourselves out. There's a fun thing to do. <laughs> so so I had a question for you. Um, being that you're talking about fighting these creatures, what if you have a child who wants to befriend the monsters? I think you could make it a diplomacy run if you wanted to, if you were against the violence. We, we don't say that the violent, uh, that the monsters are killed or murdered or, or the person gets murdered when they lose, they retreat and fall down, get knocked out. You know, that kind of language is what we use. Uh, KO. KO. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. It's like Pokemon. They don't die. Is that true? I haven't played much Pokemon. Yeah, they don't die. They get knocked out. They get knocked out. There you go. That's a good. I think that's a good model. Yeah, uh, I, I make my monsters fight each other, and they don't die because I want them to be able to fight again. <laughs> I mean, over and over and over again. They might get third degree burns over ninety nine percent of their body, but they don't die. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever notice that the the people in that world, like if if like Charizard comes down and and, and flamethrowers them, uh, they're fine too. Like, like yeah, they, they, James they, should have been dead by now. They have some sort of uncanny resilience or some kind of bullshit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry to get off on Pokemon on you, but uh, the victory bell that James has has acid in it because it's like a pitcher plant. The acid can like dissolve steel, so James being eaten by it multiple times would have killed him. Yeah. Also, every time Pikachu shocked Ash, he probably should have turned Ash to actual Ash. There's a really good Vsauce 3 video about Pikachu because it would it would literally kill you. Yeah, Pikachu's Pikachu is a health hazard if you really come up against is. it. It really is. So uh, <laughs> so kids, kids, this is your warning. Stay away from electric rats. 
<laughs> okay, yeah, don't, don't don't go near the third this, rail. This is your public service announcement for the day. If you see an electric rat, walk away. Yeah. Walk away. Uh, they're fu- they're fun to look at, but you don't want to touch them. It's just going to end up bad. Um, there are no electric rats in in Dyson Danger, right? There are some rats that yell at you when you originally steal their uh, treasure. There's uh, oh, yeah. actually there's actually <laughs> the for one of the, the really cool little images that uh, Joel drew was uh, a thief character grabbing a big sack of loot and running, and then there's these rats that have their arms up and running after. Oh yeah, <laughs> so I, see, I see that. <laughs> that that's good. Uh, yeah, I mean that's usually not what I have to worry about when I'm worried about rats. It's just like that, and like screaming at me and just like bad mouthing me but I, I feel like that does seem to be a rat thing to do <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. so so what does a rat say when it loses its treasure I don't know I feel like they are they say, pack rats rats <laughs> <laughs> There, there's your dad joke for the day. Give me back <laughs> my rat pack. That's what they say. Give me back no, my rat pack. They, they just say rats, Nathan. One, one, one is Dino. One is Sammy. No. Kids, one. I don't think six-year-olds <laughs> to 12-year-olds would get that reference. One is Frank. But it's fun for me. And <laughs> right now, that's all I care about. But, um... I'm guessing that the rats are considered basically like like a, a starter uh, uh, monster. Right, they're the easy ones to kill. When you're, you know, one of the strategies is when you're down there in the very beginning is that you want to land on man- monsters because you can easily defeat them and get a treasure card. And you want to get as many treasure cards as you can because when you get up to the higher end of the board. You're going to be getting knocked out a lot uh, by the fire giant or the uh, or the dragon itself. That's that's the hardest thing. You have to roll a ten on a ten sided die to do that. So you kind of want your magic bonuses to go with it, so that you're actually only having to roll like a six or higher or, or something like that when you when you face that dragon. I see. Okay. Um, now I'm I'm just kind of like looking over some of the treasure cards since we were talking about that. Uh, and I noticed, like, a pumpkin bomb, which just, first of all, uh, yeah, pumpkin bomb. <laughs> um, that that basically, it's it's plus four to attack, but it destroys the treasure. So are some treasures basically expendable and other treasures you can hold on to and use again? Uh, every treasure is, a, is uh, once you use the card, it is gone. Okay. So, so uh, there's no, it's not like a munchkin where you're kind of building up your... Uh, your guy like you're gaining equipment what you're really kind of doing is just gaining the the cards and then you can play the cards and then they go into the discard pile and then there's That's cool me. there's a cool card called the imp which um it's kind of like makes it go fishy you get to steal one of your uh, one of the other players treasure card when you play an imp on them and so oh. you just kind of take one of their treasure cards and then there's a jack of all trades which um, originally was going to be used for the the card that you can't um, use when oh, from your certain character class. Like the uh, the knight can uh, is really good with indestructible shields, but can't use a magic arrow, and uh, and that's kind of how the character classes work. And um, where, like, a scout is really good with boots of speed, but then he can't use pumpkin bombs because they make too much noise. Uh, that kind of uh, approach. Um, okay. And so, uh, and so the Jack of All Trades now is a card which gives you another chance to keep your premier card. So regardless of who gets it, they get to use it on their card. Because we were finding that it was that the specialty card was just not coming up enough. And uh, so the the thief wasn't getting boost to speed enough. The fighter wasn't getting the enchanted sword enough. The uh, the uh, knight wasn't getting the indestructible shield. So that gives you another chance to get your uh, specialty card, as well as the king card will also give you another chance at getting your specialty card, if you would like it. 
Okay. Um, how many cards can I play in my turn? Well, it is uh, you can play one move card, mm -hmm. but you can always add a Queen's Blessing to it. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. And then you can uh, play one attack card, and you can do a you can add a Queen's Blessing to that. And a King card can also be a Queen's Blessing if you want it to be that. And then in the um, last stage is the uh, is like the healing potion indestructible shield stage. The indestructible shield will keep you from losing a turn after you after you, after you're forced to retreat, and the healing potion will get you a second chance to go fight the monster. Oh, okay, I get you. Now, how many of each card are in in the deck? Um, there are three of each of uh, the cards, and then uh, we, we, we produce a 54-card deck. And mm -hmm. so there, uh, with that, there are 10 character class cards that, that come with that deck. So now we're down to 44. Then it's 3 times 13, which gets us up to 39, and then I think there are five other cards that have been, um, or four other cards that have been uh, uh, kind of assigned extras. And I know the Jack of All Trades has been signed an extra, and I think there's an extra Imp in there. And I think there's maybe an extra Queen's Blessing and maybe an extra King card. Okay, yeah. I I'm just thinking because I'm totally card counting, and I want to just make sure I know uh, how many how many I've used in the game. <laughs> Do you have a lot of kids that are like, okay, they've played three Queen's Blessings, so I can't use, okay. Like, <laughs> like really strategizing through this deck, like, and, and then you know you can take them to Vegas. Like, you I just... Think, I think you'll need a lot of... Yeah, I mean, I do think there is this uh, game theory optimal kind of approach that is probably fairly complicated to do on the fly, which poker players would do it if they were betting gambling on money Oh, yeah, to do it. Uh, uh, I'm not sure <laughs> we're not endorsing that activity. No. <laughs> but something. Uh, we're a little less rigid about people that want to use it as a drinking game, but we are... Uh... <laughs> it's good drinking game. Good drinking game. You get a king's treasure. You get yeah. a king card. Yeah, you can, you can, you can. Since since a king card acts as any treasure card, maybe my treasure is a beer. So I can just use it that way. Yeah. That seems like a fun thing to do. Yeah. Um, it's it's drinking quest for kids. <laughs> juice Is quest. It it's apple juice quest. Is there something called drinking quest? Yes. Oh, oh yes. wow! I didn't even know. That. Yes. I, I've got my trilogy edition sitting next to me. We've uh, we, we we've talked to Jason Anarchy. I I know very well that there's a drink. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, that, that that and that was also a trilogy. Come to think of it, um, so it's Apple Juice Quest, Alex. Yes, we we <laughs> should uh we should get on the, uh Jason and see if he can make a drinking quest light for kids. <laughs> so that. Seems you can, like we'll see it. We'll see if he wants to work with you on making a kids' drinking game for not lose. <laughs> I'm going to Disney Quest right now. On <laughs> that's great. That's, I'm surprised that's... I haven't seen this game before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it's a, it's a thing. The mystery here is how how did I not see this already? <laughs> it, it's, yeah. it's a it's a very silly game. It is a very silly game. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's also kind of like a simplified RPG, but really for, for people who wanted to drink heavily while they were doing it. Not heavily. It's, it's, it's beer. Well. You drink beer. <laughs> it is not, it is not recommended you drink it, uh, drink hard alcohol while playing drink quest. Look, uh, I'm just thinking of the immortal words of Chumbawamba, and if I remember correctly... You, yeah, you can down. take a whisker, whiskey drink or a lager drink. You can take you take a cider drink. No, I'm gonna t I'm gonna tell you right now, Nathan. If you play Drinking Quest with shots, yeah, you're not playing much Drinking Quest. <laughs> <laughs> or, or I won't be playing Drinking Quest very long. That same, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, I kind of figure. What happened to Nathan? Uh, he's on the couch. <laughs> he's, he's having a bad night. <laughs> we should have told him he has to pace himself more with this game. Um, yeah, well, I think again... Or, uh, trilogy edition. Yeah. It's yeah. So popular. How did I not learn about this game? Oh, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's because you stuff. haven't been listening to Delve. <laughs> <laughs> not enough, obviously. I gotta start. It's gonna be oh. part of my reli- the new religion. Yeah, no, no, no. Jason, Jason did super well with uh, with that. Uh, he did that all himself, uh, and uh, yeah, he, he's awesome. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, I think Dyson Danger could be like like that for for kids. Maybe I don't know. Um, a lot of sugar. I, I think that it's a lot of sugary drinks. Yeah, that's all. That's also probably not a, a great idea. I get. I can see a lot of. Uh, I'd get sick if that were the case. Actually, too much cider. Yeah, just too 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 much juice. Can't I thought this it. was going to be a kid friendly show, and now we're talking about booze. <laughs> well, you know, the kids love that. <laughs> they love, they, love, they, love talk, they love hearing adults talk about things they can't and, have and that, that they can't have. Yeah, I mean that that when I was a kid, that's what I wanted to hear all the time is just adults having adult conversations that I don't quite understand. Like and then you talk all the time. then you can just sit there and say, ha, ha, "Of course I know what you're talking about," and feel like really you know smart, even though you don't really quite get what's going on. That's half the fun. All right then. <laughs> or, Whatever Nathan says. What, yes, exactly. That's the first rule. Is <laughs> that's the first rule? Whatever Nathan says is canon, and that's how we that's how we work. Um, now, when we're talking about uh, dice danger, which was something we were talking about beforehand, I remember. <laughs> remember uh, that one time. Remember that one time, like earlier in the day, when we were talking about dice and danger. Um, do you? how have uh like quests that are already set up in the game or is that something that uh like your your gm would actually figure out uh, on the fly uh dice and danger is a board game like Candyland, so every time you play it's the same route and it's the same thing so it's it's a board game uh atlas kings if if people do the uh uh, deluxe version of the Kickstarter is included with that. They, uh, that's the thing that actually lets you expand and level up your characters and 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 play. And we had a crossover of the artwork for this baby steps mentality of going from playing a simple board game to playing a simple RPG to then going to where you maybe advance all the way up into a mature RPG that you'll play for the rest of your life. So uh, that's kind of the the thought process. It's like Dice and Danger is like the reading primer, and then you start reading Goosebumps, and then all of a sudden now you're reading for pleasure for the rest of your life, you know, playing the game for pleasure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Now on that note, uh, I know that Dice and Danger is, is really made for, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 as a primary. But have you had any veteran gamers play it? Uh, yes. Yes, a lot okay. of them at uh, the, the Game Theory Store. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great game store. <laughs> yeah. of all the game stores in the world i think game theory and raleigh is one of the best and uh and i am feel very fortunate that it's close to me yes yes Trust david price and the owners bo king both friends beautiful uh yeah. friends because i you know was hanging out at their store all the time. That's, how it is. <laughs> that, that's a good way to make friends. It is. Hang out in their store. <laughs> you, you're uh, here pretty often. Let's just be friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is my in-person friend request. Can you just accept it? <laughs> it's like Facebook in real life. Here you go. Yeah, right, right. I like the store here. Um, so, 
what was the impression that those veteran gamers had the first time they picked it up? Uh, it's it's a good game. I mean, you know, people that have played games all their life like like Dice and Danger. It's it's they know it. They've played the the young games with their kids. They realize, wow, this is this is this is on par with Clue. This is like a good uh, a fun game that you play with your kids, as opposed to being. Uh, uh, something you endure. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I always bring up Hi Ho Cheerio. That's that's my least favorite game in the world. <laughs> yeah. It's so easy to spill out your cherries and you're just wanting the game to be over. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I totally understand that. Um, now, uh, you are currently running a Kickstarter campaign? Yes. It's up on Kickstarter. It's going through uh, August 31st until 10 p.m. Excellent. Uh, now, uh, what is uh, if I wanted to get a copy of Dice and Danger while the Kickstarter campaign is going on? Um, how much would that uh, would that be? Yeah. So the uh, the cost of the game is on um, the Kickstarter. The the early bird is third third, and we haven't run through the early bird yet. Is uh, thirty dollars, and you get free shipping. Now, if we run through the early birds, then then you'll have to pay the ten dollar domestic shipping uh for a game which would run it up to 40 we are going to do suggested retail at 39.99 so that's 40 bucks uh so there's a value to getting that we also have a deluxe the deluxe version which combines and we probably won't sell that independently of the kickstarter that combines the um Dyson Danger board game and the Atlas Kings role playing game all in one package. And that's we're selling for $50 free shipping for the early birds on that as well. And then we also have a retail option of buying four Dyson Danger, Danger games for $25 um, bucks a piece. And the shipping is free on that. Okay. I got gotcha. you. Um, that's a- good. Bucks, 100, 100 total bucks. It's it's one of those things that you know we want to get the number of users up so we can get the cost of making the game down. And right. so the game itself right now is going to cost us about twenty bucks to make, and we want to get that down under fifteen bucks to make it feasible. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, what would your run have to be for that price? The ultimate have- would be to get a thousand thousand copies. Thousand copies. Okay. Um, that seems uh, doable. I mean, it looks like you're already going pretty strong, and you're you're only, like, halfway through. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah, we're, that's we're, good. we're hoping, you know, and we believe in this game, so it's going to get made regardless of how much funding comes from the Kickstarter. It's going to... It's going to have a life, and it will continue. It's uh, the game's done. It's except for a few tweaks to the wording on the card, I, and and how and the rules write up. So there's once once the funds come in, we are going to order the games and package them because we really would like all the contributors to be able to give it to their kids on Christmas or in advance of Christmas. Like, even better. Even better. Yeah. Nothing. There's nothing better than slaying monsters or sorry, knocking out monsters on Christmas Day. Yeah. Well, we always played a holiday game in my family. My dad was a uh, chess champion. Um, he was. Thanks. He was five-time West Virginia State chess champion back in the fifties, and uh, nice. and so he he just taught us to play games from the time we were walking, and so. Uh, we were probably playing them in, in, in the cradle. So, uh, uh, so we did it. I learned chess when I was five years old and was never very good at it. <laughs> right. So, so got taught not to play chess. My game was Dungeons and Dragons when I found it when I was 13. Uh, I, I still remember that day when I see that basic Dungeons and Dragons box with a red dragon on it and, you know, Guy in armor shooting a bow, and a and a guy and a wizard with stars and moons on his robes casting a spell, and my hands trembled, and I just grabbed that game, and I took it home and read the entire rule book that night, cover to cover, and and it was 
started it all. That's where yeah. it all came from. I would love to see what kids would do when they show up with Dice in Danger. Kids like me would just love it. That's what would happen. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and when, you, uh, when you did grab that D&D copy, did you do a lot of, like, homebrew stuff out of the gate? Oh, totally. You know, when you when okay. I did basic D and D, it was uh, we cl- we basically did. There was a little adventure at the back of the book. Me and my friends, we basically just cloned that thing for the first first three years of mm. when we were in junior high. It's like none of us had much <laughs> ability to go off the page, so right. we, just, we were just making the same adventure over and over and yeah. over. Just which monster did you put in the varying rooms? It was yeah. what we did. And then some of the better players in my life, I met a group that we still play uh, and started playing towards uh, probably first year of high school. And uh, they they introduced the concept of having a town and adventures where you go that mean something more than just going in, fighting a monster and getting treasure. And uh, and so then that set me down the path of uh, Temple of Elemental Evil against the Giants campaigns, all the great Gary Gygax stuff. And now I'm a huge fan of Frog God games and Pathfinder, uh, the, the greats over at Pathfinder, like James Jacobs. And, uh, and uh, I think Wes Schneider just stepped down, which is bad, but I know Nick Logue and uh, Greg Vaughn have written for them a lot. Those are all really fabulous adventure writers. Mm, absolutely. Um, I, I just think about, like, uh, I don't know if you ever saw Stranger Things. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I keep thinking that, like, that first scene in the episode where you can tell, like, they don't really know all the rules of Dungeons & Dragons. They're just making it work. Like, <laughs> they have and, a Dungeon Master. That guy was good. He was really good. Like, huh. Oh, he was <laughs> okay. good. Oh, he was a really good. You know, when it comes to um, Stranger Things, the guys that made that are from my hometown. Really, and the Duffers? The Duffers are from Durham, North Carolina. And that's where I'm from. And, oh, wow. uh, and I actually made a very similar movie in, in 2011 called Lights Out Row, and I, I mentioned that with the books that we talked about. And it's where uh, Stranger Things was all about. You know, the kids playing Dungeons and Dragons and going out on their bike to find their missing friend. Uh, Lights Out Rowan was about um, a girl and her younger brother getting on their bike to go find their missing family. And they were going out into the suffocating darkness, darkness so thick that if you don't have light, you will fall asleep. So, Uh, yes. Scary. Fan of Stranger Things and kind of consider Durham kind of where that... (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> Central yeah. idea that Spielbergian <laughs> love. It all kind of comes from that, doesn't it? You know, do you remember E.T.? Do you ever see E.T.? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like having that original scene in there where uh, they're playing uh, uh, Tunnels and Trolls. The reason they're playing Tunnels and Trolls and not Dungeons and Dragons, that scene, is because Gary Gygax did not allow them to use the game because he was right. trying to own movie made yeah. very much like m&m's not letting them do it that made reese's pieces yeah <laughs> reese's pieces yeah i feel, I feel like dnd missed they were all, nothing yeah. before that and then they were huge after that I don't even yeah know people still eat reese's pieces that much oh yeah absolutely oh gotcha gotcha so, yeah. uh, i i feel i feel I feel like uh, like maybe Dungeons and Dragons has taken a bit of a left turn in their in their policies since uh, since Guy yes. you know, Guy Gax because because well, uh, you know it was like oh my god what what were we thinking not letting them use our products in their yeah. movie? that's yeah. the advertising oh, yeah. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> like no one no one knew what a demigorgon was until Stranger Things came along <laughs> no one cared and then it's like oh. Okay, I yeah. get it now. Yeah. But yeah, no, that was that was a smart thing. Uh, the the one criticism I had always heard was from longtime players of Dungeons and Dragons that they were going, "Well, they're not playing it the right way for the <laughs> <laughs> dude." It doesn't. That's the point. That's the point. No one knew how to play the game. <laughs> they all made it up. Right. Or, Oh. Right, 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 yeah, yeah. Okay. They were, I mean, they were simplifying it for the masses as opposed to 
being rules. What, what's that term? The, the people that are the rules. Rules lawyer. Rules. Oh, yeah, I've I've heard it. You know, like I, I given the 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 time, I don't like to use the term like rule Nazi right now. I mean, that's that's that's, that's out. Uh, the general term for that is usually a, a rules lawyer. Rules lawyer. That's it. That's exactly that's right. it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Uh, yeah, no, apparently a lot of rules lawyers came out when <laughs> when Stranger Things launched. How dare the kids not know how to play Dungeons and Dragons properly? Because <laughs> like, it doesn't it's like it doesn't matter. Right. They're having fun. They're enjoying it. Yeah, I thought yeah, I, I, I love that series I, i'm very much looking forward to the uh Two. second season i had friends that actually worked on it the second oh season. nice so uh, it's good stuff you know i'm uh i'm a big fan so, yeah uh, halloween perfect halloween. time to watch it is a perfect time to watch i'll stay in and watch stranger things though i think uh netflix might lock up on that <laughs> right? yeah it's like the, the night that uh luke cage came out so uh, uh oh, yeah. I think, I think Stranger Things might even be their their most successful show. You know, it might be. It might be now. I'll be interested to see what happens when Defenders uh, launches. Oh, uh, well, that's going to be insane. Yeah. That's going to be a big deal. <laughs> I've already heard some pretty good reviews back from some people that heard uh, that saw the early releases. So that's going to that that might lock Netflix up for a day. Yeah, I expect so. Yeah, yeah all right. Thanks. Anyway. I might give it a couple of months before I watch it. I'm, I'm still catching up on. Uh, I'm rewatching Game of Thrones because I'm such a Game of Thrones uh, fan that I'm watching it all over again, and it is so good. I don't know if you guys are watching. Uh, it. I, I I'm I'm completely up to date. I just saw it on Sunday, so. Gotcha. Cool. Oh uh, yeah, Alex doesn't. Uh, it. There's so many subtle little things about like. One of the things I picked up in the things like Kyburn jo- joining the uh, the uh, small council for, with the queen and right. and the and you're like you have these little things that when I first started I just didn't think much of it and then all of a sudden once you know what's actually going to happen you're it's like a big deal <laughs> a big deal that was a yeah. big deal that but oh, they yeah. treated it with just blase better. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. just like, oh, yeah. wow. But they knew where they were going. They've always known, you know. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. They're, they're good at doing, like, those throwaway pieces that you think nothing of. And then, like, two seasons later, somebody will say, well, no, that makes perfect sense because this. And you go, oh, my God, I did not even see that. <laughs> I did not even figure that out. Right. And, yeah. yeah, that's that, that's one of the most fun parts. Um, I would say more, but I feel like we get into spoiler territory, and I know how people feel about that. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. <laughs> I just love that. I had uh, we had one person that was on the show who had read the books and had not seen the series, and he was like, like, like the people who who were watching the series were so excited, and they were like, "Oh my god, did you see this?" And "Oh my god, did you know this?" And and the 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 guy who had read the books was like, mm, "Yeah." Yeah, I've known that for a long time. And, uh, and then when it finally got to the point where the series started to surpass the books, everyone was like, oh, my God, you should have seen what happened on the thing. It's like, hey, dude, I, I sat on all this information for 20 years. You can't sit on that for like a month. Can you do that? Like, <laughs> I didn't spoil this for you for two decades. Could you just not? Spoil it for me. <laughs> and I, it's like, yeah, I, I kind of understand that. <laughs> yes, but, yes. I'm yeah. big. I, I, I hate to have things spo- spoiled, so I will... Uh... Now, one thing that as I get older, I find myself really good at forgetting. So sometimes yeah. <laughs> people will tell me something. I'm like, okay, all right. Man, yeah. I wish you would have told me that. And then I, by the time it actually comes around, I've completely forgotten. Oh yeah, and, and then you feel like it is a spoiler, even though you knew it to begin. <laughs> you told me this, never. Um, yeah, Alex, you don't know anything about Game of Thrones. Nope. 
Okay. <laughs> Joe's don't like care. He's, proud, he's a proud uh, uh, abstainer of the uh, of. Uh, I have yeah. Jim stains from watching Game of Thrones. I keep trying to come uh, into it, but he won't. I abstain uh, from watching anything that's currently super popular because people tend to spoil it and ruin it. Yes, that is true. So- so uh, basically, you're you're uh, oh god, what's the word for that? Hipster? Um, you're a hipster. No, I'm a- yeah. anti anti uh, popular person. Yeah, you're, whatever. You're you're anti mainstream, not like because it's mainstream, but if it's something like Orange is the New Black or Game of Thrones or even the new Doctor Who series when that first came out, it's like this seems interesting, but I'm not going to watch it right now because everybody's talking about it. Oh yeah, you're too co- you're too cool for school. I get no. I, get, I just I just don't want to watch it and have see, it talk about it while I haven't caught up. See, that's that's where the two of us are very different. I like things that I like, and I watch things I want to watch. So there, I like things I like and watch things I want to watch too. I don't like the internet ruining everything. What? That's the function of the internet. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's kind of all the internet is. It's the entire point of the internet at this rate. All the internet does is ruin things for you. Well then. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> yes. the kicks. We were talking about the game, and then we ended up talking about Stranger Things and Game of Thrones. And you know what? That feels like pretty much every single one. Of, we should just change the name of the show. So we'll get to Game of Thrones eventually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We should have just said to – we should just call this uh, spoiler alert because we're probably going to say something about something. I wonder, I wonder if that's a podcast. I think it is. It probably is. I know it's a T-shirt because I have that. I have a spoiler alert T-shirt, and it's red and it has yellow letters on it. And and uh, if I ever go to Gen Con, I am totally wearing it. That is a good uh, idea. Yeah, and and everyone will be angry at me before they even know who I am, and I kind of love that. Well, I love uh, I love your name, Delcast. I had a dwarven character named Deep Delver in my early days of. Uh, yes of uh gaming so uh i have a big fan of the word delve <laughs> yeah well we were too that's why the show's named that um <laughs> and and uh, is the root of pretty much everything that we've done since right alex yes we just delve right into everything we can yes we do we we delve deeper and deeper and into a, a hole of our own making it seems but um so the the back, back on track um the so the kickstarter goes through the 31st uh and you're hoping to have it out to people before the end of the year yeah we're we we i've looked into the timing that will be required you know they say it takes about two weeks to get the money back and then uh and then we will place our orders and those are going to probably take about oh six weeks so we'll be getting the games uh around the end of October, right around Stranger Things launches, and nice. uh, and then we will box them up, depending on how many there are to box up, and ship them out. So we're expecting it everything to be out middle of November in, in the mail, so it'll be showing up in Thanksgiving. We we would love to have the game all completed for the Christmas season because. We expect that the, there will be some long tail kind of stuff uh, in addition to the Kickstarter funds. We actually think we we believe in the game. We we believe it's going to be one of those that stays around for a while and maybe it's never a huge success, but it's like always something that people want to buy for their kids. The new gamers coming up. Candyland sells one million copies a year, so <laughs> if we were just one, that's that's one, still a thing. <laughs> yeah, Mil- uh, Milton Bradley and, and Hasbro and stuff I still pump out those games. They've been pumping out for years. You don't go to uh, the uh, the game board section of Walmart or Target very often. No. Yeah, it's it's all the same games you've been playing for the last three decades. Oh. Monopoly and yeah, and checkers and chess and yeah. All that kind of stuff. You can always find those games in uh, Walmart. And every now and then they'll introduce 
kind of a hot new one. One thing I didn't see the last time I was there was Trivial Pursuit. I wonder if Trivial Pursuit's dead now. No, they keep doing new versions of it. Gotcha. That was, I mean, that just took over the world when it first came out. Mm. Oh, yeah. I mean, I guess it's one of those things where as long as you have just any Trivial Pursuit board, you can just get any pack of cards for a Trivial Basically. Pursuit. And right, just for sure. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's the one. Way. Yeah, that's the one great thing about it is that just any pack of cards and any board, it's pretty much going to work the exact same way. <laughs> it's just what questions you're going to get asked. Um, I did, however, realize when I picked up the original version of Trivial Pursuit, I totally do not know the answers to most of those questions because they're really? about like, well, because they're about like pop culture and sports that are just before my time. Gotcha. So it's all eighties. That's all how how stuff. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It 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 like it it arises from a lot of stuff from like the seventies or eighties. And I was born in the eighties, so by the time I get around to it, I'm like, I don't know who that person is. What is right. that show? I uh, and they made later versions, like they made updated versions that I was like a little bit better at. But um, then like a sports question comes up and. I don't know the answer. I <laughs> I just I right. don't know the answer. Right. Um, you know, yeah, just as the world gets more options and more like the internet and all this extra information and cable TV was the same way. Is we don't have that shared lexicon of pop culture like we used to, or maybe the kids do, but it's like. Uh, we all in the eighties could, we could all those things. Everybody knew, you know, it's like, you know, Oh right. yeah. Everybody had seen Rocky. Everybody had seen star Wars and Raiders of the Lost Ark and all those stuff. It's the same way now. This has everybody seen something. I don't know. Stranger things. Right. When they're at the school or they're all talking about stranger things all the time or whatever. But, right. Um, yeah, there's not a lot of the um, like the the water cooler shows anymore or, or stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, Seinfeld was one of the one of the best ever for that. You know. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, the closest thing that we have now is like Doctor Who and Game of Thrones and Walking Dead and those sort of things. But right. Um, but I feel like the internet is our collective water cooler now. Like, it's just, we all just go on there and talk about it. We don't actually talk about it in person as much. So. I just found Doctor Who. I mean, I've known about it all the time. I just never did it. And I finally, um, I was a big fan of Penny Dreadful and, and Billy Piper in um, particular and Penny Dreadful and Eva Green. I thought they were both sensational. Mm. And, and so then I was looking around for Billy Piper stuff, and I thought, like, oh, she was on Doctor Who. And so then I just started watching it, and I really, really like it. So it's one of those, my next binge is going to be probably Doctor Who. So uh, after I catch up on Game of Thrones, we're going to do a Doctor Who binge. Nice. Good. You shall enjoy. Yes, you you, you shall. Um, I, I, I watched the first season. I've done all the Chris Eccleston stuff, but now David Tennant, who is a, one of my personal favorites he was so good and jennifer jones as oh, oh, uh, jessica jones yeah 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 jessica jones, yeah, jessica jones and, uh, oh he was he was the, he was one of the best <laughs> villains that marvel had <laughs> yeah he really is fabulous yeah. yeah marvel's not known for their villains he was the purple man was a good one and, right. and then at the end of the season though i was like i don't know what they're doing for the second season now <laughs> jones, yeah. they'll, they'll figure it out i guess yeah, I guess we'll find out the vendors. One, you know? yeah, yeah. yeah, I know. No, no, no. David Tennant was one of the best doctors, um, and I like Matt Smith afterward, too. I don't know how you felt, Alex, because I know you're a big Whovian, so. I, I enjoyed Tennant. Uh, he was, both of them, he, between going from Eccleston to Tennant, it took some getting used to just because he was new. And then you got into him, and then you got from Tennant to Smith, and it's like, all right, this guy's kind of goofy. And then you're like, oh, he's goofy, but he's really good. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, and and you yeah. Like I haven't watched any Capaldi. I haven't had. Um, I have with anything that gets Doctor Who in a while. So I'm I'm up to speed though. I can tell you Capaldi is really good. Yeah, I heard he was really good, and I'm looking forward to the female Doctor Who. I know there was a lot of yeah 
uh, protest, but I think they, they picked a really good actress to play, oh, yeah. and I'm looking forward to seeing what they do. Oh, yeah. I was hoping the new Doctor would be Jack Harkness, but you know. That would have been interesting. I, I will give you that. <laughs> I, I was actually aiming for uh, Haley Atwell. I was kind of hoping that that would happen, but I'm cool. I'm cool with it. Mostly just because I was like, Agent Carter should kind of be the Doctor. That seemed uh, to make sense to me, but uh, but but I'm 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 cool with who they got. She's she's a very good actress, so uh, I thought that that would be cool. Too. Were they thinking Haley Atwell for Doctor Who? There was a talk that they might get Haley Atwell. She was definitely in the running. She definitely wanted it. They uh, they, they she she yeah, had done some pictures. That might, that might have been a mistake because she could have been. Well, maybe they'll use her again because she because wow. I mean, I'm a big fan of Haley Atwell. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that there was a, like a lot of talk leading up to it um, that Haley Atwell was was really like trying to to get her name floated past, and there was there was talk around that as one of the potential uh, new Doctor Who uh, uh, actresses. So, um, but uh, but you know what? I'm cool. I'm cool with what they did, and uh, I know that David Tennant was really happy for her too because they worked together um, on Broadchurch, I believe. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She was yeah, really yeah. good on Broadchurch. Mm. What's the name of it in the the, the American version of Broadchurch? Is it Grace Point or something like that? Yeah, I can't. I don't remember. I didn't really see Broadchurch. I didn't see the American remake either. Um, but I know that de- no, very the very thing- good show. Very, very good show. Broadchurch is fabulous. Yeah. 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 Um, I I guess it was like it's like a long term like murder mystery sort of thing, right? Yes. It's, yes. But it really gets into the. Uh, yeah, it's 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 like its own thing. I mean, it really is uh, a fresh take at a detective show, and uh, and I I was a huge fan of them, huge fan of David Tennant, and uh, yeah. and so yeah, and that's actually I wasn't a huge fan before Broadchurch, and then I became a huge fan, and then and then Jessica Jones came on, and then I'm like. Oh yeah, well, they would tell you this is my new. I just knew him as that guy from Harry Potter that like was. Oh, the yeah, yeah, slithery guy, yeah. <laughs> yeah Barney, Barney Crouch or whatever. His Barney name. Crouch Jr. I believe was yeah, uh, yeah. And, and he didn't. It was the least used he's been in anything he's ever done. <laughs> right. I yeah, feel like. he did a voice in How to Train Your Dragon as well. Oh, that makes so sense. It's not the least used. Yeah. <laughs> I did not see uh, How to Train Your Dragon. Uh, you should I, see it. It's cute. Uh, yeah. Well, I, 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 Netflix had like the second one, but I wanted to see the first one first, so I haven't gotten a chance to see it it's, yet. It's good. It's adorable. It's got all dragons and training and stuff. Wait, How to Train Your Dragon has training and dragons? Yeah, you potty train them. <laughs> I'm guessing that Dyson Danger doesn't have that particular thing. <laughs> no, it does not. That's good. I think I'm happier now knowing that. Just bathing, bathing dragons. Bathing, bathing dragons. Bathing dragons. Got the got the sheets over them. That's good. You know, that's only the decent thing for water dragons to do. <laughs> Everything comes full circle. Everything does come full circle. Uh, and this is why earlier I said we do edit. Yeah, yeah, yeah we do, fun, man. You guys have the funnest show to be a guest on. I'll tell you that. Oh yeah, exactly. I, f- I feel like our guests agree with that most of the time. We we can we've had how many people come back this season to be on again? It feels like every guest. <laughs> it feels like it feels like literally every guest came to do an encore performance this season. Um, well, uh, I've got a yeah, I've got a game that I'm. Currently, it's you know I've I've been doing the kids stuff and we're going to keep going with the kids stuff and expand on all that. But uh, I've got a game called Rooftop Roads that um, I am excited about. It's not ready to really talk about yet, except that you're you'll be playing thieves and uh, stealing stuff. <laughs> that's, Fair enough. That's it. I've always liked the idea of running a thief oriented. Uh, tabletop RPG campaign 
but you got to have everybody on board that you're going to be doing that. And often that's difficult to do. And, right. but people that, you know, you can kind of get the same flavor of that playing a board game. And most people will be up for one night's activity of being a thief. They might not keep coming back for a RPG that would last for months or years, but they, uh, they can get into that game. We've, we've been play testing it. It's it we need to work out the rules still a little bit, but the, the general concept of having fun doing that is, uh, is, uh, showing promise. And so we, we, we enjoy kind of tinkering around with it. So hopefully I'll get that done at some point and then I'll send it back to QA and I would love to come back on the show and talk to you about it when, it, when it's ready. Absolutely. We'd love to have you on. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, uh, I I would personally probably really enjoy playing a like Thieves Guild RPG where you're all just members of Thieves Guild or something. That's it, and then you got, you got a campaign version so that you could actually have uh, from uh, from game to game you could see your guy re- rising up in the guild, and then you know stuff like that. Getting better at thievery. Getting better at thievery. Thievery. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> That sounds fun. Uh, yeah, they should they should make like a game uh, on like every single one of the guilds from like Elder Scrolls. You could do the Mage Guild. You could oh, do absolutely. The That's yeah. A good, yeah, 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 yeah. There, there, you know, I'm good first one thing, and that's just random ideas. Yeah, I mean that's that's Nothing that's. Else. But you're getting right to it. I was always going to Rifkin and Skyrim, and oh uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. one of the, what were they the nighthawks or something or something like that uh, nightingales nightingales yeah one of the nightingales i was like yeah i saw a poster one time did it said uh i always start out that i'm going to be a fighter this time and then inevitably i look like this and it's exactly like my characters look oh, yeah. totally sneaking around all the time i was a big fan of thief and uh and uh, the Shadows of Mordor, where you're basically, uh, it's basically these stealth games. You know, it's really good stuff. I, I'm a big fan of sneaking around. You get these kind of almost like puzzles uh, with all the guards and stuff like that without it being kind of overtly a puzzle. You know, I don't play games that much, but but the, yeah. but yeah. the figuring it out, oh, I got to go here, and then I got to stop... And then I gotta go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. A- absolutely. Yeah. Uh, one one day they're gonna make the Dark Brotherhood game. Oh my! Um, God. That that's, that's gonna be that awesome. that that is dark. <laughs> that is so awesome. No, no one will survive. But yeah. Yeah, but that would be pretty great. Yeah, uh, my my current character in Skyrim is a heavy armor wearing orc using two handed weapons, and I have the Daedric uh, Prince Boethia's armor because I'm his champion or her champion, whoever the fuck it is. Um, so I have the Ebony Mail, which is a ebony heavy armor that casts muffle on you when you crouch. And enemies in close proximity to you take uh, poison damage over time. So I'm in heavy armor, uh, stealthing with a two-handed warhammer. <laughs> like all thieves, like every good thieves standard equipment. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I went. I went. Th- I just recently went through Golden Glow. You can look at my uh, Twitter, and I posted a video from it. I was hiding in a corner. It was- mercenary staring at me unable to see me while taking poison damage and it killed him from half full health to dead i was like yay he didn't see me i get sneak bonus and he dies that's awesome what game was that again that's in skyrim wow yeah yeah you can do some pretty cool stuff in skyrim when you get to higher levels yeah, I haven't played in a long time. I, I was so addicted to Skyrim for like the first three months I had it. And yeah. uh, it became a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. Um yeah, that that was I, I I when they came out with like the special edition, I was so uh, like I, I looked at it and was like, Oh, that looks so good, but I played the last one for like three hundred hours and I really can't make that commitment again. Yeah, that's what happened to me. It's yeah, yeah. real life was too pressing for me to to uh, be able to 
throw myself in the game. Skyrim just came out at the exact right time for me too. It was mm -hmm. came out right at like in November in the winter that I wasn't going to be doing much, and I basically just stayed home and played Skyrim. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a good way to pass the time. Uh, like every day for like months straight. Um. <laughs> Yeah, every 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 non-work hour was spent. <laughs> oh, absolutely! Oh, I came across a new town. There's the next three days of my life. Yeah, That's all you need to know. Right. Oh my god! Yeah, I I spent so much time just trying to level up my three crafting skills so that I could use them in conjunction to make the best blades ever in the world, <laughs> like the best enchanted swords I could possibly make. And then I just used two of them. And just started killing everything. This is an ice sword, and this is a fire sword with electricity. Here, smack. That's I get like all I did. I get all itis because you know I was like, okay, that's because I'm kind of role playing in my head, so I can't have the same character go be the mage guild and then be in the thieves guild. So I have to create a mage guild character and uh, a thieves guild character and a darkest brotherhood character and a stuff uh, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love so, the idea of a Dark Brotherhood game. I think actually we've been thinking about uh, expansions for roof, rooftop rogues if we ever got to that. Just kind of just pie in the sky because we're not done with the base rules yet. But I think a uh, rooftop rogues Dark Brotherhood has to happen. That's just, that would be that would be good stuff. Um, almost yeah. better than the original in my oh, head. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you're killing stuff you know? yeah it's, it's like the darkest timeline for that game right it really is sort of like that oh yeah no that that's got to be a thing oh my goodness oh you know i'm starting to realize if i do the youtube video and i don't cut anything it's going to be a long episode for that <laughs> right, so maybe we should uh wrap it up so you don't have to go through too much stuff. Yeah, probably. But I, I mean, it's a, it's all good. Yeah, it's all good stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, I can, I can do an outro. That's one of those things that I attempt to do. Usually, it takes a couple tries, but, uh, but I'm usually pretty good at it now. We'll Right. Hit, us. hit us with hit us with an outro. I've never heard an outro, but I like that term. Oh yeah, it 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 is it is good. You might not want to hear another one after you hear this, but <laughs> I don't. You never do. You you wish I didn't do it uh, at all. Oh, Sometimes. Yeah, you know, if you'd like to, you can you can try your outro. No, you your outro. I've done an outro. I you can do it. Yep, that's uh, that's the general sentiment. That's why I do it. Um, <laughs> all right, I can, uh, yeah, sure, why not? I can do that. Alex, do you often get into danger yourself? Uh, I do, usually when getting into a bathtub with dragons. Yeah, you got to be careful about that. Um, and, uh, always bring a towel. Always. always. Don't always. forget your towel. Don't forget to bring a towel. Uh, so, uh, Alex, if, uh, if folks wanted to maybe grab a towel and uh, go to a website. Uh, where could they find more episodes of Delve? You can find more episodes of Delve over at our website, as Nathan kindly pointed out, which is delvecast.com. That's right, and you can find all sorts of fun stuff there, including some of our uh, developer diaries, Delveloper diaries, I didn't forget, Alex, and, uh, and episodes of the show. Uh, Hal, if uh, the folks out there would like to find more information about Dice and Danger in the Kickstarter, uh, where could they go? www.diceanddanger.com. We've got that URL, and come find us. Absolutely. Uh, and then you can get Dangerous and roll dice at the same time, too. Absolutely. That's very nice. Uh, you can also find us on uh, a whole bunch of places, I guess, uh, anywhere you find podcasts. But specifically, you can go to iTunes or you can go to Google Play. Uh, and uh, please like and review and subscribe while you are there. Uh, you can and also, mm -hmm. but, but, mm -hmm. what is it? You can also find our shows, the whole hour, some odd episodes we do without being broken up over on YouTube lately as well. Yes, uh, I think it was the just the one that we we put up uh, very recently from Loot the Room was mostly unedited. Uh, 
Uh, and so you get to hear uh, some of the the random banter that uh, doesn't really work in the in the show proper. If you want to check it out there, um, and you can also find us on Twitter. I am at Citanium. I am at EXP Limited, and the show is at Delve Podcast. How? Uh, where can they find you on the Twitter? Uh, Jim, where can they find us on Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> What's our Twitter handle? Uh, it's at uh, we're Invader Films on uh, on Twitter. So uh, okay. are we at Invader Films? Yes, if you do that, you'll find us. At Invader Films, you'll find us. Okay. Excellent, uh, and uh, that uh, you 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 tweet a bunch about Dyson Danger, I imagine, on there. Some yeah, of the other yes. projects. Yes, we okay. do. Very nice. All right. Well, um, I feel very dangerous. How about you, Alex? I feel. Are you in the danger zone? <laughs> <laughs> you better call Kenny Loggins. Can roll I call to the... see if you're in the danger zone? Can I roll to call Kenny Loggins? Um, <laughs> if you roll enough dice, maybe the numbers will be correct, and you <laughs> call Kenny. Maybe that's the fate of the dice. Like, just roll a bunch of d10s and see what the numbers are, and then just call those numbers. That would Done. be a that would be a terrible crank call game, but somebody <laughs> will probably do it. <laughs> There you go. Let us know how you go, how your uh, crank call dice game goes. And if you randomly do get Kenny Loggins, um, all you have to do when you get it, it he'll go, hi, this is Kenny Loggins, just kind of go, dice in danger zone! And he hang right up. Hang straight danger up. Danger zone! <laughs> danger zone! That's all you need to do. Please tell me if that happened to you. Please, please, please. Um, you know where to find me now. Uh, and I want to thank Hal so much for being on the show. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Love being here. Excellent. And uh, Dyson Danger is super great. Uh, and uh, keep supporting them uh, because uh, the Kickstarter goal is almost there. And you know you want it for Christmas. Anyway, uh, so thank you for joining us, everybody. We'll talk to you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.